Hey guys, Dr. Ken Norberg back again to talk to you about bear hunting, <laughs> black bear hunting. I've got a lot of experience with black bear hunting. <laughs> I, um, you know, as I told you last time, the first few years that we hunted them, we used rifles, our deer rifles, which was fine. But uh, at that time, being very serious bow hunting, bow hunters, especially my son Dave and I, we were pretty serious about that, we decided to try hunting bears with a bow. And uh, with our experience, we were pretty sure that a bow could be every bit as deadly as a rifle, which turned out to be true, really true, it's kind of really amazing. As a matter of fact, you can, you can, uh, a good shot with a bow would have put a bear down much more quickly than it will put down a mature buck. Uh, Whitetails, they have a lot, they're capable of running 100, 150 yards after the kind of shot we're going to be talking about here with a black bear where a black bear might only go six, seven yards after being hit. And uh, you know, I've paced it off many times, and only once have I ever taken a bear that went further than 17 yards after being hit with an arrow properly. And I talked about you want at least a 60 pound, 60, uh, pound draw on your bow or the equivalent of that with a, with a compound. And I would I recommend standard arrows that have some weight to them. Uh, I personally use 125 grain broadheads, but I've used 150 as well. But I like the weight there because you want foot pounds of energy in that arrow when it hits a bear. You know, a deer is only about this wide from side to side in the chest area. A black bear is wider, and not only that, if you're going to do a really good job of killing a black bear, uh, the ideal shot is a quartering away shot where the arrow enters the bear uh, on one side, on your side of the quartering away position. Uh, halfway down the body, I mean halfway down the body, but you can see there, behind what you think is the last rib, and that's further back than you realize, you know, it's almost to where that front hind quarter comes in, it's just maybe six, eight inches past that, and that bear's quartering away. You're going to go through into the bear behind that last rib, and it's going to angle through the lung on your side, high on that side, and then it's going to angle through the bear's heart, you know, and when you, when you field dress it, you'll find that arrow of passive is going through the heart, and then it'll go through the opposite lung, low on that side, and finally it'll hit bone on the way out, low, be below the shoulder on the opposite side, and it with good foot pounds of energy, it will come right out of the bear. Sometimes, not all the way, it kind of depends on the size of a bear. A 500 pound bear, there's a lot of tissue <laughs> that you have to get through. And uh, with that extra foot pounds of energy and plenty of draw weight, uh, I put arrows through bears in the 400, almost 500 pound class without any problems. Just zip right through, especially if it doesn't hit bone going in, and it won't hit any until it gets to that chest wall just inside the opposite front leg, it comes out. And I've seen bears jump back after being hit like that because this arrow showed up and they're right in front of them. They're, they're wondering what it is. They don't even realize they've been fatally hit right at first. But most of the time, they just go. <laughs> I mean, almost immediately, uh, they'll barrel through whatever's in front of them, and that's kind of amazing uh, because you're going to make sure there's a bunch of stuff in front of them. 
and then it won't be very far in about just a few seconds all of a sudden you'll hear a roar like a lion loud roar, three to five times and as quiet and he's dead but that's the ideal shot with a bow now I remember when I first started hunting bears it was really frustrating because I had to wait and wait and wait. I wanted to wait and wait. You know, broadside shot's all right, but if you hit bone going in, you know, one of those ribs might deflect a little bit. When it hits the rib, maybe on one side or right smack in the center, it cracks through there. It sounds like, it sounds like this. Like, that's the sound it makes when it's breaking through bone, when your arrow runs. It's like somebody's slapping your face. That's the sound it makes. Well then, there isn't going to be as much foot-pound energy when it gets to the other side of the bear's chest, and if it has to go through a bone again, uh, it might not get very far outside, but you, you know, you're looking for an exit one. And so, that's why quartering away is ideal. And it's ideal for another reason. When the bear's quartering away, it can't see you. Now, bears have Poor eyesight, relatively poor eyesight. But they darn well can see movements. And uh, they might even realize you're up in a tree there, but you're not moving. You're not being aggressive in any way, not being dangerous. But they might not realize you're up there. But if you're raising your bow, when you, you know, here's the bear. You're sitting there waiting and waiting. I remember sitting there and wait, wait, wait. And then more than once, I got tired of waiting. So I decided, I'm going to see how slowly I can raise this bow without the bear seeing it. Never made it. They're gone. And once that happens, you know, you disturb a bear that's feeding at your feet site. He's gone. If he's a big one, a little one might come back but not a big one, he's gone. So it's really disappointing when that happens. So, so after a few years of going through this kind of thing and waiting and waiting and waiting, and, and you know, the longer you wait, the more nervous you get. You know, you're getting to the point where, uh, you know, if you're sitting there and you think you're gonna have the bear 50 yards away and you're sitting 50 yards away and the bear's way over there, uh, but even there, you know, if you move, He's going to see that movement just as likely as if he's right there. You're going to see it. You get the same response. Zoom, he's gone. Uh, so, uh, but you, you know, you get tired of waiting and you try it. That just doesn't work. It just, uh, you might as well have to put the bear up close within seven yards. Uh, with all the bears I've shot for quite a few years after I once, once created this way of making sure I get a quarter and a way shot soon without having to wait a long time. Uh, uh, you know, I never, never felt the urge at all to raise my gun. But anyway, if he's 50 yards away, I started to talk about that, and you're waiting and waiting and waiting, and pretty soon you get your gun up. You know, that gun is going to be moving. <laughs> and if you hit the bear, it might not be fatal, chances are five times out of six or seven you're going to just wound it. Then you got big trouble. Then it gets to be a dangerous game tracking a wounded bear especially late in the day it's getting dark. <laughs> you don't want to be in that you don't want to have that problem. Get the bear up close. There's nothing wrong with that. You're nine feet up. Everything you do is going to be perfectly safe and you're going to be able to to uh, make a fatal shot, quickly fatal shot, much more easily than if he's way over there. And not only that, uh, doing this, you won't have to wait long. I've had bears, I think I mentioned that last time, I had one, uh, I heard he was so excited when he smelled my, uh, my honey and cooked bacon at, at my uh, positioning bait site that he knocked down a rotten tree on the way and it just crashed to the ground and then shot right past me, right under my stand, on my stand trail, 
and went right over there and you know he was that way and of course my stand is kind of sitting at an angle and the, the, the positioning beta was that way so he came right in really fast went right there he couldn't see me lapping honey sounded like a dog drinking water up you come full draw halfway down behind the last rib touch that that trigger on your mechanical release watch that that um, your color knock disappear right into the spot you aimed at. Perfect shot. It just within seconds from the time the bear first appears at your stand side until he's down and roared three times. Just so quick and easy. No waiting. No chance to start getting more and more nervous. Uh, perfect shot every time with bow or gun. You know you never have to worry about this. this Taking on a big bear is perfectly safe if you do it this way. That's why I wanted to do this. So, now in the old days, what we used to do, we'd find this place. Hey, there's a bear sign here, and there's a beaver pond right over there. And, uh, you know, big tracks, gee, some eight inch tracks, nine inch, yeah, over in the mud by the pond there. Or maybe it's a couple hundred yards away, but it's east of your stand site which means the westerly is carrying all the scents from your bait. In a big wide area here, you got big grease paint on tree bark, quarter mile north, quarter mile south, big area of smell. Then we put that cooking oil around the bait side, and bear walks out of there and he's got cooking oil trail scent all over the place up there. So no problem getting the bear in early, uh, the first few days that you after you put out your bait, everything on all set for you. Now, that's fine. That that's why you need all that bait doing the way I was talking to you about. That's why you need that bait crib. We put it in the middle of this opening. We created an opening. We cut all the brush, all twigs and and raspberry stalks and hazels and that kind of thing. Not big trees. We cut them off. So you clear this opening and this really thick cover. Remember, you want a really thick cover all around you if you're going to attract a big bear in during daylight hours, legal shooting hours. So thick cover all around you. So got plenty of that stuff right here. You said, well, this is the spot I want. Here's a good place for the tree stand. And sitting there, I'll never be facing west. You don't want to face west. Because the big bear is going to come in in the last hour of the day, most of them, and you don't want to be facing the setting sun. Uh, for a couple of reasons. For one, uh, it's going to be kind of a little bit blinding to you. There's a bear down here, and you bring your bow up, and the sun shining in your eyes. You know what? You don't want that. Not only that, it illuminates you. It's like you're on stage in a theater, and there's a spotlight on you. No, you want to be facing any direction, but not west. In, when you're bear hunting and when you're sitting in the tree. Okay. Now, here's, I drew a picture here. Now, this is not wonderful artwork, but I wanted to draw this for you so you, I make sure that you understand how this works. Okay. Here's a, here's a, oh, here's a tree, the tree stand. And the tree stand is pointed, you know, my bait crib is right there, and then the tree stand, for me, is pointed this way. So it's nice for a rifle. Well, nice for the bow, you know. It does bow limb doesn't touch your stand or your tree stand. It's all clear here, and you didn't cut everything off your tree. There's branches in the tree below you. I like big evergreens, and there's branch boughs out in front of me, all the way around me, all the way up. So I'm kind of in a tunnel up there, where I'm sitting in the tree. You know, branches out above me. I don't stand ever deer hunting or bull hunting, I, I shoot from a sitting position. I practiced that for years. I'd go to an uh, archery range in the wintertime, I'd bring along a folding chair and I'd put it down, everybody else was standing, not me. I got my chair and I sit there and I shoot from that position. I get so I'm really good at sitting from a sitting position. And if I do get nervous, I'm not going to have quivering legs bothering me. And if you're shooting a bull, all that tension takes the shakiness out of your arms as well. So anyway, sitting. 
Well, so here you are. All you need is nine feet. You don't need to. You don't need to cut all these branches off. Back in 1985, I had a famous bow hunter come to my camp. I invited him there, and uh, I brought him out early one morning uh, to a stand in a tree, a uh, corbel that I had set up for him. And then I climbed up in a tree about 30 yards away with the video camera, and I was going to videotape him shooting what I figured was going to be a 10-pointer. And there he, he, was, he had a tantrum up there in the tree because there were branches right above his head there because he, he bragged about using a bow with 90 pounds pull and but the only way he could come to a full draw is raise the bow straight up like this and he used both arms pulling, pushing and pulling to come to a full draw with the thing. Well, he never did it while sitting, ever. So he didn't know how to fire that bow of his from a sitting position. And so, right away, he gets a little saw he had in his pack out and starts sawing branches up, up above here. And pretty soon he was standing up. And pretty soon, here comes a 10-pointer up the trail. It stopped about 70 yards away. I got photographs of it here. And looking up there, I saw him, then turn around and walk back in the direction they came from. So we got back to camp, I showed him that. Why well, is it my fault? He didn't get the deer because I didn't properly prepare a stand sign. I didn't know anything about setting up a stand sign. Well, that's, you can't be standing up, standing up when you're hunting the deer these days, especially if you're hunting older bucks. You can't just do that. You got to learn to sit from a, uh, shoot from a sitting position, whether at ground level or up in a tree. Well, anyway, so movement is bad. That's why you want that bear when he races them. First thing he wants, to do, first thing he's going to do, and I'll tell you more about that, but is go to that positioning bay. Now, here's a opening out in the woods, all thick cover all around it. You know, it's so thick you wouldn't see a bear come until he sticks his head out into that opening here. And here's the setup. Here's a stand in the tree. Here's the bait crib in the middle, all the logs covering up on the bait. You got four logs forming the this, this space where all the bait goes, and then the logs on top, and they're six feet long. That's your measuring stick. And um, so it's kind of open here. And then all the little twigs, the hazels, or uh, any kind of stuff, uh, raspberry cane, anything like that that's standing in there, little brushy stuff, would cut off near the ground level. And we pile, we pile behind a tree on the opposite side. You want a tree on the opposite side. One time I didn't have a tree on the opposite side. I dug a hole and, and put the, a log in the hole <laughs> and covered it up. So I created a, a tree on the opposite side. It wasn't a full tree, but, uh, but you want one on the opposite side. The tree right, this tree right here is seven yards away from here, seven yards across there. Kind of a circle. It can be oblong or square or whatever. It doesn't have be a perfect circle. But anyway, uh, and that's your setup. Now, we're legal, and it's legal in Minnesota. We use honey and or cooked bacon. Now, I, I, you're not supposed to provide raw pork to bears. Well, bacon is processed, and you probably wouldn't have to do it, but you get more smell out of it if you fry it a little bit. Not so much as stiff. You want it to be limp, limp bacon. And I usually go out there with a dozen strips of limp bacon. Uh, when I fry them at home, I put them into a plastic bag, uh, the, all that bacon, and then put that plastic bag in another plastic bag so I make sure I've got airtight closure. And from that time, you don't want to touch the bacon. Uh, you don't want the bacon smell on your hands or the honey smell. Now honey, we usually get a jar by a jar that's got about two cups of honey on it. What is that, 16 ounces, something like that. So, and uh, good tight cover on the top. Now, I ne we never use positioning bait except when hunting. You know, during the two weeks we have before the season starts, we're bringing a lot to bait putting it in that bait crib, and, uh, but we don't put any honey or bacon out at that time. 
only when we're hunting. So let's say here's opening day and it's now one o'clock and you go out to the woods and it's been two weeks now since you've been providing bait and it always happens. I, I, you know, I mentioned I always put watermelon in there and smash it and the bears will eat that watermelon right down to the rind. So you, well, you got a bunch of nice little green dishes out there <laughs> made from watermelon rind. If you don't have any, you can use a, a, a paper bowl or something like that. But I always use the watermelon rind and I put about a, oh, almost a cup. Pour it from your jar. You can open it up. Don't get it on your hand. Pour it in your little bowl. And you go over there and stick that bowl behind that trunk of the tree on the ground so that where you, from where you sit, you only see half of it. You know, it's sticking out. Uh, here's looking down, uh, here's the tree, and the bowl is over here on one side like that, behind the tree. Now, another thing that's important about this is that all this stuff that you did, and maybe more from around, you, you build a brush pile behind that. So you big pile of brush over there, here's your bowl, little opening, little cave-like opening you make, you know, pushing stuff aside, it goes in there. A nice brush pile behind that, behind that. And the reason you put it there, you don't want a bear coming from this way and facing you to drip, to lap up your honey or eat your bacon. You want it to, the only way you can get it is to come from this side. And then, it's because it's over on one side of the tree and partly behind it, it's going to stand there quartering away, you see? Here, here's it. You're sitting in your stand, you're looking down, here's the bear, the green bear. <laughs> and here's that bowl down here. And you, what you did with the bacon is, you got out there, you open up your bags, and you take a stick, and you only touch the bacon with a stick. And you take your bacon and hang it on little twigs and branches in that brush pile right? close to the tree on this side. You don't want it on that side. The brush pile should go further back than what I've got pictured here, but you want a brush pile there. I get it pretty big and pretty long. Probably eight feet long and maybe four feet across at the bottom and pile it up there. And, and so bacon is hanging on twigs off the ground above the ground, behind the tree there, and the honey's in that watermelon rind right there. So when that bear comes in, he smells honey or bacon, he's going to want that a hundred times more than anything in here. This got him here, but when it's time to hunt, this is what's going to make him stand there, making his own noise facing away from you so he can't see you, you're free to move all you want then, as long as you do it quietly. And and take aim, no waiting, no messing around, boy, a perfect shot. Halfway down on this side of the bear's body, and back behind there, back rib, it's not too far into that front part of that ham. And pull that trigger on your release, or your gun, pow! Both lungs and heart, you got him, and boy, he's, he's going to go down so quick you can't believe it. So anyway, see where that's positioned? And you see the situation here, and the bear has to go quartering away from you. He's got all this brush here he can't get at. The only way he's going to be able to get at is right there. Perfect. Everything's all set up, just perfect. And that's it. That's the east, north, or south over that direction. Don't worry about wind direction. The bear is going to smell you anyway, no matter what direction the winds. So forget that. Forget that when you're hauling in bait. Forget that when you're going to your bait site to hunt. Forget about wind direction. Just ignore it completely. And you can do that because this that bear is used to smelling you there. You know, you guys that hunt deer with with a with a what do they call it, food plot? I call them bait plots because I don't think there's many food plots that aren't used as bait. Well, your scent is pretty recognizable there too, but the same thing happens there. 
once a big buck has got you spotted there during the hunting season, day one, first hour, once he's got you, he's not going to come there during the daytime anymore. It doesn't bother them. They, they're half nocturnal to begin with. Yeah, those older bucks, they've been through this. Uh, after so many years of people using baits of various kinds, they're used to this game. They know what this is all about. So it's going to stay away. If you're stuck with one food plot, then what are you going to do? Huh? The first day you didn't see that buck. He saw you. He smelled you. He heard you. You moved. He saw you. Something happened. And then sit there all week, 10 days, two weeks, never see the big buck. Well, how come? Well, it doesn't matter whether you're using a, a deer call or rattling antlers or doe and heat lure scent or bait or clover or turnips or something with a lot of protein in it, like and that's the new ridge. It doesn't matter. The, once you disturb that deer, once he's got your peg there, that big guy isn't going to come in. Young ones will come in. It takes them a while, if they survive, to survive this kind of situation. But same same thing is happening. But anyway, so here we are. This is absolutely the very best way to get set up while hunting for bears, big bears especially. It's absolutely the best way. It just makes it so much easier. So, now, now you know where to aim at the bear to get the best result. You know how to get that bear quartering away quickly so it looks like that when you take aim. You know, and the fish down there. This brings him in. This gets you the bear quickly before you get all nervous. And so, there. That's the story about positioning bait. And you'll find everything you need to know beyond what I've had to say here about positioning bait in my new bear book, my newest bear book. It's all in there. Diagram. In fact, the DVD that comes with the book will show you. Here I am out in the woods and I got a bear, uh, you know, uh, uh, it looks like a bear. And I'm down there with the positioning bait next to this tree and I put that I'm down there on my hands and knees, and I've got this bowl there with the honey there, and the bacon in the branches, and i got this bear silhouette, and he's quartering away, and then i got another, I'm up there in the tree stand, I'm looking at it, and there's the bear silhouette, just like the bear would be, and you can see why, that that's just perfect for taking a bear. And the, and the great thing about it is, the honey and or bacon, and I, I use both because I, some bears are wild about bacon and others are wild about honey. I've known some bears that were wild about honey. I was cooking in the woods on a fishing trip <laughs> and we had some pretty exciting situations develop because of that. But honey, honey and bacon are the absolute best positioning. But I've tried lots of other things, including uh, sardines from Norway, <laughs> and kipper snacks, well they smell pretty good to me, uh, ham bone, <laughs> you know, nothing works better than honey or, or bacon. You guys that can't use those things, uh, and you're using a barrel, Maybe right from the beginning, you should have your barrel over there in place there with a brush pile behind it. You know, your barrel of fermented corn, have it positioned so, and with brush all around it, so that uh, instead of crib, this is what you have to work with all the time. Like say in Wisconsin, I got a barrel with fermented corn in it, and it's got a hole in that. The bear goes there to that to eat. You got rocks around, kind of have it sitting there so it doesn't roll out of position easily, that kind of thing. But anyway, with the breath, put a brush pile behind it so that forces the bear to come in and have it at an angle like that because there's a tree out there kind of in the way, so you have to be quartering away. That way you're going to get that easy shot right away. 
your your bait might not be as effective as this, starting out with the, about 12 different things in here for a couple weeks beforehand. There. That big bear, nothing in this 30 square mile range that's as good or tasty as that. So he's got, that's going to keep him coming back. Well, this might do it too, but not maybe not. You know, it, it's not going to be quite as effective as using this program here when, when you can. Have it. Go start with the, the 12 bait, bait crib, keep them coming, keep, get them used to being there. You'll have a trail going in and out. There's several of them. Might look like spokes of the wheel going through all this heavy cover around that by the time by opening day. But start with that. But, but finally end up with positioning bait. So now the thing about the brush pile is it happens every single time. Every time I've hit a bear quartering away, he went right through <laughs> the brush pile. I mean, it's like a tank. Just crashed right through there and head over there. Speaking of that, you know, I know a guy who only uses fresh meat for bait. Uh, after a while, he's got more wolves than bears, and the bears don't like wolves, so pretty soon he's just got wolves. But it, then he uses the meat as positioning bait as well. And uh, having it open and uncovered uh, at, when you're not hunting is not a good idea because that any open and uncovered meat is going to disappear real quickly. The ravens will get it first day. So uh, meat's great, but it's not, not an ideal positioning bait. Because so, if you have just meat there, well, you'd probably come here first because there's lots here and you might go there first, but maybe not. So, well, so now you know all about positioning bait. You all know all about where to aim at a bear. If you're a bow hunter, it's got to be broadside or quarter away, and quarter away is four times better. If you're a gun hunter, just because you're using a gun doesn't mean you can good gut shoot a bear or shoot him in a ham or anything like that or a leg and expect to get the bear. Uh, if you were just to wound the bear and um, hit flesh in a hind quarter, front quarter, uh, side of one chest, that bear could go for days. And if he's a big boar who's used to having his own way about things, I mean, any he, he's out there eating blueberries and there's this younger bear there. He'll go over there and spank that thing with those big claws and that longer bear isn't going to come back. He's used to having his own way. I don't share my blueberries with anybody else. you, you got a bear like that you're dealing with. You get close to him and he's watching his back trail and he's hurting. You might be hurting. You, know, you want a good shot. Both lungs, both lungs and the heart is even better. So. Being, taking the care that I'm telling you to do improves your chances of a quickly fatal shot by a hundred percent or more. So do it. No mess around. We, you don't waste bears. <laughs> we don't have enough bears in the world for, for, bull, for bear hunters to be wasting bears. So, okay? There you go. Now, one thing more I want to tell you now, I want to, I want to do one more bear hunting YouTube presentation on how to recover a bear. You know, it might be a simple thing, it's over there 17 yards away, that no big deal. But holy man, at, at first, you know, when you shoot one from a tree and you're sure you got it and things didn't work out, you can have a hard time finding the bear, even if it's only 17 yards away in that heavy cover. So, and then once you get the bear, you got to field dress it, and um, you got to treat you got to treat that bear quickly. You got to get that carcass and that hide cool down quickly, so you, you don't lose it. And you have to do that much more quickly than you do with a whitetail. Much more important. So we're going to talk about those things in my last bear hunting. Uh, so look for me in, in a week and 
Oh, I, I should be ready to finish it up for you. Now, another thing, be sure to hit that little red button there. Uh, I'll tell you why it's important. The more people I get to subscribe to my YouTube presentations, the better. You know, right now I've got over five, well over 5,000 people subscribed, but I'd like to hit 10,000 if you could. And I'll tell you why. I'm being paid for putting on these seminars, but I have to have uh, subscribers and I have to have a lot of people watching my I have a lot of people. We're, I, we're way over a million minutes of people having been watching uh, now. Uh, you know, <laughs> this has really been great. And I'm, I'm really happy about that. The more people I can teach, the better. And, uh, I, you know, I enjoy doing this, as you know. And so, anyway. Uh, Hit that subscribe button, you'll be notified as within minutes after my next YouTube presentation is uh, on the air, on the internet, and, uh, and uh, so there you go. And thanks for watching. I'll see you again soon. Be sure to visit my website. Here's the link. Here you'll find links to my blog posts, my Twitter account, my YouTube account, my Amazon store with links to my ebooks. My son's eBay store, a money saver if you're ordering from Canada or other countries. And be sure to sign up for my email updates. Here you will also find deer and bear hunting articles, my website bookstore, and much more.